Your support is important to Living on Earth. Donate today by pressing the donate link on the left of this page. Every bit helps. And thanks. So say there's one slice of pizza left in the box and two of you eyeing it. Your human brain says, we can share, but your animal instincts say, mine! Well, of course you share. Voluntarily sharing is one of the ways we define our humanity, part of what separates us from the animals, right? Well, recent research from Duke University's Hominid Psychology Research Group indicates we are not unique in that regard. The group's director, Dr. Brian Hare, works with one of our closest relatives, the bonobo. Bonobos are a second species of chimpanzee that usually many people haven't heard of because they only live in the Congo Basin and they don't live together with chimpanzees. Chimpanzees only live north of the Congo River. If you get your map out of Africa, you'll see that north of the Congo River, that's chimpanzee land. And south of the Congo River, that's bonobo land. Life in bonobo land is very different from life in chimp land. And Dr. Hare thinks we could learn a lot from those differences. For example, his latest study puts bonobos in the same situation as that pizza box showdown we talked about. Basically, they had a choice between sharing food uh, with another bonobo, or they could just hog all the food themselves and gobble it down. And and how we gave them that choice is we let them into a room with some prized fruit. Also in that room, there is a door, and the door has a one-way key. And if they open that one-way key, they can let in another bonobo. Now, the other bonobo can't enter the room unless the bonobo that has all the food decides, okay, I'm going to let this guy in and he can have some food. So that was the choice they had. And drum roll, the answer is they love to open the door and let the other bonobo in and share the food instead of just eating it all themselves. They would like to eat together. What do you think is uh, driving this? What do bonobos derive from sharing food? Well, I think that bonobos are very social. You know, their social world is so important to them that evolution has sort of shaped them so that they are very tolerant with one another. They enjoy sharing food. They aren't as competitive as their close relative, the chimpanzee. uh, And that really just enables them to be a little bit more generous than other species. Now, when you say social and they like to share, I kind of can imagine you using your fingers to make little air quotes because those of us who have heard of bonobos know, oh, yeah, they like to share. (laughs) What else was going on while they're eating? Well, okay, so so bonobos are famous because they're very tolerant with one another, but they're tolerant because anytime there's tension in the group, they use sex as a social lubricant. So if there's a lot of food provided uh, to bonobos or if they find a big fruit tree in the middle of the forest in the Congo Basin where they live, then usually what happens is instead of what a chimpanzee group would do, displaying and fighting and saying, okay, I'm dominant, get away from all this food, bonobos basically just rub themselves all over each other, they chill out, and they go eat together peaceably. Basically, bonobos don't want to eat and then play and have sex. They want to eat and play and have sex. So what is the the evolutionary benefit of this? I'm assuming there must be some benefit to to them. Is this an, an example of altruism, or are they gaining some advantage here? So that's the that's the sixty four million dollar question because um, I mean really what we were trying to test with this experiment is that we know that animals share so even chimpanzees they share food and many other animals share food but usually when animals are sharing food there's some very simple um, selfish motivations that could be driving the sharing so for instance. When it comes to chimpanzee sharing, well, we know that chimps will often share with non-relatives, but when they're sharing, they're sharing because they're trying to get somebody who's harassing them to go away. So what this experiment really rules out is that it's not that they're sharing because of harassment. So then the question becomes exactly what you just said. Is this altruism or is there some other underlying selfish motivation? And we've got some ideas about what those might be. Such as? It may not be that this is purely generosity in the sense that, oh, I feel so sorry for that bonobo next to me who has no food, and it just hurts me that that poor bonobo doesn't have any food, so now I'm going to give that bonobo some food. Instead, it might be, hey, I'm on a blind date here. I've never met this guy. I might interact with this other bonobo in the future, so why don't I just give him some food, and maybe next time we meet, that bonobo will be nice to me. So uh, a favor in the favor bank kind of approach to— You got it. Huh. So basically, it could be there's some political strategizing going on here. Does this kind of behavior seem to pay off for bonobos? Are they more successful because of this? 
Well, I don't know if it makes them more successful than chimpanzees because they actually live in very different places. So is it that there's something south of the Congo River that has shaped the bonobos so that they have a very different social system than chimpanzees. So chimpanzees have male dominance. They have lethal aggression where they raid neighboring territories to kill each other. And they do all these things that sort of represent the darker side of human nature. But bonobos are female dominated. There's no evidence for lethal aggression. And instead, when there's some tense moment in the group, they have sex and they have a good time and they share food. So really the question is, what is it that ecologically south of the Congo River has allowed bonobos to sort of have this relaxed, more egalitarian society. And how can we mimic that in our society is what I want to know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they, Boy, they've got it made. You know, people sometimes ask me, oh, what's the most intelligent animal? And, you know, what makes humans so much more intelligent than other animals? And I always say, no, 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 no. We're not the most intelligent ape. The most intelligent ape is the bonobo. Wouldn't you want to live in a society where, you know, there's peace? And that sounds pretty good to me. Uh, I like that. Not to mention the, you know, the sharing food is nice and then the, uh, you know. Yeah, that's not bad either. And, <laughs> and you know, sort of uh, it's like the 60s all over again. So, so yeah, I mean, it, it, it could be a lot better if we, could, if we could release our inner bonobo and tame our inner chimp. We might be happy. So, you know, hopefully if we keep doing lots of research at this orphanage, Lola Ya Bonobo uh, in Kinshasa, I mean, the sad reality is bonobos are highly endangered because of the bushmeat trade. And the place we work is a bonobo, san- I mean, is an orphanage for babies of mothers who have been killed for their meet. And so hopefully if we keep working with these guys, we will find ways to uh, learn and unlock a little bit more about the biology of aggression, especially if we compare chimps and bonobos to one another. And I mean, what species could be more important to study than the species that's found a way to live peaceably among each other? Dr. Brian Hare, leader of Duke University's Hominid Psychology Research Group. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Jeff. On the next Living on Earth, the U.S. Postal Service wants to save money by cutting Saturday service. It will also deliver a smaller carbon footprint. Reducing that would be equivalent to about 315 to 500,000 metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions a year, equal to about 60 to 95,000 gasoline-powered passenger cars. This postman always thinks twice about greenhouse gases. Next time on Living on Earth. Living on Earth is produced by the World Media Foundation. Our crew includes Bobby Bascom, Eileen Belinsky, Bruce Gellerman, Ingrid Lobet, Helen Palmer, Jessica Elise Smith, Ike Shreese Kanjaraja, and Mitra Taj, with help from Sarah Calkins, Marilyn Gavoni, and Sammy Souza. Our interns are Emily Guerin and Bridget McDonald. Jeff Turton is our technical director. Allison Lirish Dean composed our themes. Steve Kerwood is our executive producer. You can find us anytime at LOE.org. I'm Jeff Young. Thanks for listening. Funding for Living on Earth comes from the National Science Foundation, supporting coverage of emerging science. And Stonyfield Farm, organic yogurt and smoothies. Stonyfield pays its farmers not to use artificial growth hormones on their cows. Details at stonyfield.com. Support also comes from you, our listeners. The Ford Foundation, the Town Creek Foundation, the Oak Foundation, supporting coverage of climate change and marine issues. And Pax World Mutual Funds, integrating environmental, social, and governance factors into investment analysis and decision-making. On the web at PaxWorld.com. PaxWorld, for tomorrow. PRI, Public Radio International.